the Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I want to thank you for being with us here on the Paul Leslie Hour. The fascination and excitement I'm feeling right now, well, it's palpable. George Shapiro is here with us. He's one of the most influential talent managers in entertainment and a television producer. He's represented the best of the best, Jerry Seinfeld, Carl Reiner, the late Andy Kaufman, and others. George Shapiro also produced the television show Seinfeld, called by many one of the best shows of our time. With the late Howard West, he formed the management production company, Shapiro West Productions. George Shapiro is an exuberant, a very exciting person to talk to. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. How are you, sir? Well, Paul, that was the best introduction I ever got. Would you repeat it, please? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm kidding, but that was, that was a beautiful introduction. And I know that you're, you're a very special interviewer, so I want to congratulate you on all the years of success you've had with the, with the Paul Leslie Hour. Well, that's very kind of you. I appreciate that. I think most stories are best from the beginning. What are your most vivid memories of growing up in the Bronx? Well, the, 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 the camaraderie with my friends in the Bronx, we all went to PS80. It was a grammar school, and uh, there's 15 friends that we bonded when we were kids. And uh, with 80 years later, we were still friends, and we did a documentary, The Bronx Boys Staying Alive at 85, and we just did another documentary called The Bronx USA, where the boys celebrated uh, their 85th birthday, and we went back to the Bronx, we went back to PS80, we went back to playing stickball, we went to Dewitt Clinton High School, and we saw, we, we met with all the kids there, mostly, you know, uh, financially challenged kids, minority kids, a lot from Puerto Rico, and and Samoa and Africa, and uh, it was uh, just a, a great, ex- exuberating experience. And uh, so we did this uh, documentary based on that called The Bronx USA, which, which is on HBO now. And, uh, and we had some very prominent people from the Bronx that appeared on it, including Robert Klein, who sings and dances on the streets of the Bronx, and Alan and his wife Arlene Alda, General Colin Powell, a Bronx boy, Rob Reiner, Carl Reiner, Chaz Palminteri, who wrote The Bronx Tale, that was a movie and on Broadway, Melissa Manchester, and Grandmaster Melly Mel, who started hip-hop in, uh, in uh, the Bronx, and also Hal Linden. But the best part of it was just being with friends and bonding with them and playing games with them and going to the movies. Of course, then they had double features in those days. They had two movies. They had cartoons, they had the newsreel, they had serials, which continuing characters like Superman and, and Batman and uh, the Invisible Man. And uh, it was, we went into the theater at uh, 10 a.m. and got out at 4 p.m. with the blind, being blinded by the sun. But it was all about the uh, laughter. You know, we, we saw all the comedies. Uh, it was, uh, you know, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello and... It was a very big part of my life it was laughter from the beginning. And it's the greatest thing to have friends like that since you're five years old. And I'm glad we did the documentary. The one that's on now is called The Bronx USA. Don't miss it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about your parents? What would you say you, you got from your parents? Well, it's so interesting because part of the documentary had me visiting my home apartment when I was from, I lived there 45 East Marshall Parkway in the Bronx. And uh, I lived there from the age of four to 11. And I talked about my, my mother and my father and uh, the influence they had on me. They were both so very loving and had a, a great sense of humor. They loved to laugh and uh, they had the most beautiful hearts. I know I, I try to carry on their tradition of generosity and humanity and fun. And I remember when going to the apartment, there were people there from El Salvador that lived in the apartment and they were so wonderful and gracious, you know, showing me around, including the little bedroom that I shared with my brother 
who uh, who beat me up constantly because he was three and a half years older than me. But most of the memories were good. That wasn't the best. But uh, one of the things I remembered was we would have uh, dinner, and my uh, mother and father would do the dishes. My mother would wash the dishes. My father would dry them. And in between, they would be kissing each other. So it was just uh, I was brought up with a lot of love surrounding me. And uh, even when no one was in my apartment, I'd walk in and I'd just feel that flush of love. So I feel very, it was a great question, by the way, because <laughs> my parents are responsible for everything in my life and my total inspiration. Wow. Well, you know, there's something that's come up again and again on this show. And that would be, there are a lot of people in show business, whether they're musicians, they're actors, or they're behind the scenes, they're a manager or an agent. A lot of people, they either work in a mail room or they work at the William Morris Agency. I hear that <laughs> a lot. And so you can learn great things from any job. What did you learn from your time at the William Morris Agency? Well, I started the William Morris Agency. It was after, you know, uh, I got out of the Army. It was around the time of the Korean War. And I, I, I went to work for $38 a week. I always say that is George Shapiro's weakest negotiation. Minimum <laughs> wage, $38 a week. But the the, uh, the in the mailroom we basically we delivered films and we delivered uh, scripts and mail and in the in the in, in New York City in the wind and the rain and the snow and uh, it was a very good education because in the within the mailroom uh, it was before computers so all of the inter office memos had to be Xerox you know by us and then distributed to each agent we had a little push card and we deliver the mail to each agent. But what we learned by reading the inter-office memos was every kind of a deal, every kind of strategy that an agency would have. It was the greatest education. I went to New York University, but, uh, but I, I took the wrong course, accounting, which I, I couldn't uh, keep up with because I used to fall asleep. But because, uh, you know, uh, the uh, what I learned at William Morris was uh, incredible, just reading everything and connecting with agents. And also, we when we had to take shorthand and, and typing, because we worked as assistants to various agents when the when the uh, regular assistant was out. In fact, I, we floated. They call us floating assistants. And once I floated into Colonel pa Parker's office, because when he came, Elvis Presley was a client of the William Morris Agency. So when Colonel Parker came up from Nashville, they would give him an office and uh, and a floating uh, secretary assistant. And, and I did that. I worked for the colonel a couple of times. And he always used to say, George, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. How much money did we make? <laughs> but he, you know, he, he liked money a lot. His deal, I think, is out there. People are aware of it. It was 50% commission. With Elvis Presley, it was like a 50-50 split. But, you know, because of William Morris, I, I met Elvis. And uh, that was a, a very memorable part of my life because I was down when he did the Ed Sullivan show. And I said uh, to him right before he was going on, it was a short press conference. I said, Elvis, the press is ready for you now. And he said, yes, sir, I'll be right there, sir. I'm 24 years old. He's like 22 years old. <laughs> and uh, I said, Elvis... You are the first person to call me sir. I'm from the Bronx, so we don't use sir and, and ma'am like you do in Mississippi. So that, that was a, a great connection and a memory that I have with Elvis. And uh, he was a very sweet boy, and it's just a shame that he died so young. He, 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 had, a very, he had a very good and sweet heart. But anyway, the experience at William Morris was great. Then after I became... Uh, a, a, an assistant for a permanent uh, assistant for Ben Griefer. He was in the packaging department. He did the Milton Burrow show and the uh, Red Button show and a few other variety shows. And you really learn packaging and producing. And that gave me a great background, you know, to become a producer when I left William Morris and went into uh, business with my partner, Howard West. I'm hoping you can tell the listeners a little bit about this gentleman, Howard West. What made him such a good partner? Okay. First of all, I go back to Howard. He was a new kid in school because I met Howard when he was eight years old because he moved into the neighborhood, Marshall Parkway neighborhood, when he was eight years old. The other boys I met in kindergarten, 
Howard I met, I think it was third, third grade, and he was uh, in the schoolyard. He was sort of alone, sitting on a, a stoop near the entrance to the PS80, and I, I felt for him. I said, you want to join us and play stickball? We play stickball and football and uh, basketball after school. So he said, yeah. So we bonded from the time we were eight years old, and uh, he sort of became my partner very early on because we chipped in for comic books. Comic books cost 10 cents. You know, uh, Adventure Comics was the first book that Superman appeared in. In fact, Howard and I bought that for 10 cents. Now, that first introductory book is now was sold recently for $3.2 million, the original. <laughs> And we had it, but I don't know. I can't find it. I I, I keep looking for it. <laughs> but we but uh, but it was it was it was a great start. So we were partners initially in uh, comic books. Then we bought our first car together, and then we bought lifeguards at a place called Tamament, which had a theater staff up in the Pocono Mountains. And then we uh, worked together at William Morris, and then started our business uh, for Shapiro West Productions, which was uh, the absolute joy of my life. And Howard is completely opposite of me. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit crazy. That's cause I, that's why I connected to Andy Kaufman because uh, I'm a, a, a little bizarre, a little offbeat. Howard is like in a brilliant, a genius businessman and very creative in, in the world of business and the type of deals he makes. So I felt that we were, we were in an incredible uh, combo. And, you know, we had that, that beautiful, love and friendship and uh, bonding since we were little kids. So he was uh, a true t- treasure in my life. We lost him about four years ago. He had a stroke and uh, he went out fast the way he wanted to because he, ne- he never wanted to linger. So, but it's uh, it broke my heart. But the connection with him and our partnership is definitely a treasure of, of my life. And it was great for us to start Shapiro West. I, I I went first. This is a, this is a prime example of, of of someone who's a good businessman and someone who just goes on emotion. Uh, when I decided to leave William Morris, it was August, and I was doing well at William Morris, and they gave us a lot of benefits. You know, like uh, they gave us a car, they gave us insurance, they gave us stock. But I once I decided to leave, it was August of 1973, and so I left. I started the business. I said, Howard, if you ever want to join me. You're my first uh, offer. Uh, you have, uh, I'll offer you the presidency. I'll offer you the best parking space near the entrance to, to our little office. So anyway, Howard waited until December. Of course, it's bonus time. He got his bonus in December. But when I made up my mind, I just jolted. And then we formed it, and we started selling shows. Like the, for the first one was the 2,000-year-old man, animated with uh, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, and Leo Salkin was the animator. It was the first deal I made going into Shapiro West, and it was every, everything. It was just an absolute joy and excitement of doing that. And, you know, and working with people, you know, like Carl Reiner, who was our, our early client, and Bill Persky and Sam Deniff, who were writers that created That Girl after they produced the Dick Van Dyke show with Carl. And we had a very strong philosophy. You know, because the philosophy was we would sign people who were very talented and had good hearts. And the good hearts was a very important part of it. Because you work at a big agency like the William Morris Agency or or ICM or, you know, CAA. It's a question of uh, dealing with many people who are clients that you have to work with. So we had had some rough experiences. One of them was with a comedian who just uh, went wild. Uh, in the director's booth at the Hollywood Palace, and uh, I don't want to say his name, but his name was Jack Carter, and you know he was very rough at that time. Uh, later on in life, we we bonded, but I uh, he was one of the examples when we went into business. We said, "No, Jack Carter's in our life. That's a flag for Shapiro West." And then right after we signed Marty Feldman, and he did Young Frankenstein, and they were at a party at. Uh, his uh, house, a beautiful lawn, and uh, and the Jack Carter came over to Howard and I. and said, "Hi, I hear you guys are doing very good management." He said, "He said, you know, I don't have a manager." So Howard looked at me and said, "Jack, I have to tell you a story." <laughs> Howard was shaking his head. He turned white. But I told him, I said, "Do you remember 
when you were screaming at, at, at Nick Vanoff and Bill Harback at the Hollywood Palace, these wonderful producers, great guys. He said, yeah, I remember, I lost my temper. I said, well, you know, when, when that, that happened, we sort of had a little agreement that there were no Jack Carters in our life. And I said it with a smile on my face. Howard is shaking his head, turning pale, but Jack, Jack took it all. So he said, but I changed, I changed. <laughs> anyway, you know, later on in life, and oh, by the way, Carl Reiner was friendly with Jack, and uh, he said Jack treated his mom great. So I ended up, you know, getting together with him, and uh, and uh, and it was beautiful. And there was another incident. I had some great difficulty with Buddy Hackett, and uh, I was really mad at him, and, you know, just uh, he did some very rough things. And so I went to see him in uh, the Sahara because I had a, a client that was a singer, John Gary, that would co-headline with him at the Sahara Hotel. And Buddy Hackett was so funny that uh, I, I, I just could not stop laughing. I fell off my chair. Comedy rules. Even if you don't like somebody, funny is funny. And he was so hilarious that I just fell off my chair laughing. That's the, the power of comedy, my young friend. <laughs> It is. It's just, it's so important. We need it. Uh, you know, not only that, but, you know, the latest research shows that laughter is a, a huge, uh, it creates endorphins that boost the immune system. If you do a little medical research, look up laughter connected with health, and you'll see that it's not only the fact that you're attracted to people, it bonds people together, it, it relieves tensions, but 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 it's medically it it, it it releases endorphins that enhances your immune system. So I love that laughter and comedy is is my calling. So how important is humor in this life? Well, there's not a better feeling. You know, it's, it's interesting because uh, I just said how important it is, and you know, you when you go out and you're at a concert and you're just laughing. You're just bonding with all the people around you. It just elevates every aspect of your life. And I loved it. I fell in love with laughter from the time I was a little kid. And I stayed with it throughout my entire career. In fact, when I worked as a lifeguard at Tamament, it was a resort in the Pocono Mountains that had a theater staff that was up for the whole summer. And the head writers when I was there were Neil Simon and his brother Danny Simon. And, uh, you know, I think Carol Burnett worked up there and, uh, uh, they, uh, Herb Ross, who was a choreographer, became a great director. So they, they, the, Neil, Neil Simon always asked us, you know, what did the girls say? It does. You know, lifeguards used to use material we gave them and embellish it, and uh, it was just was a, a total elevation of every aspect of life. And uh, it, it's uh, there's nothing more exciting. Also, a lot of times you say when you're attracted to a comedian, like when I saw Jerry Seinfeld. You know, for the first time, it, it's uh, I call it falling in love uh, with a comedian. It's the closest thing to falling in love because you're so elevated. So, and I, t I said that with Jerry Seinfeld, I fell in love at first laugh. And uh, and uh, Andy Kaufman was uh, a similar thing. He was uh, so interesting and 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 bizarre and fun. And Carl Reiner, he was the one that first told me about uh, Andy because he saw him in New York at Catch a Rising Star. You know, I was living in L.A. at the time. And uh, he, he took a trip to New York with his wife, my aunt Estelle. And he came back and said that he saw the most bizarre, interesting, fun, crazy act he's ever seen. And Carl has total audio recall. So he did, his, he did Andy's whole act. Hello, Andy Kaufman. I uh, hope you're doing well. He did the, the whole fireman routine, including the joke. Hello, I am. I uh, do the impression that uh, Jimmy Carter. Hello, I'm Jimmy Carter, president <laughs> of the United States. And then he said, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I am the dinghy baddie. I have to go. I am the, all, all in the family. Uh, I am Archie Bunker going into the kitchen. So then he said, now I'll do the Elvis Presley. And everyone's holding their heads. And he turns into the greatest Elvis impersonator <laughs> ever. And uh, coincidentally, so Carl said, you have to fly to New York and see this boy. So coincidentally, Bud Friedman, who owns the improv, called me the next day and said, you know, I'm flying in this boy, Andy Kaufman. He works at the improv in New York for us all the time. And uh, 
I just want you to see him. And that's how I met Andy. It was like a, a double header with Carl Reiner and, and you know, and it, it was, uh, you know, Bud Friedman. And when I saw him, I laughed so much, but my, my question was, is this guy insane? So I had to take him out to dinner a couple of times. And I found out he was a very warm hearted guy. When he went back to New York, he used to always stop by his grandma, Lily on the way back. So, and he bonded with his family beautifully. And then I just, I just connected with him and appreciated his, his performance art skills. It was, uh, it was an incredible experience working with him. Would you say that the experience of working with him was different than the other comics that you represented? Yes, because there was no one that was that followed the drummer that he followed. He, he, he considered himself not a stand-up comic, but a performance artist. You know, and he would do such wild things that he had, he had a part of his act called... Uh, you know, the the bombing segment of his act, the bombing routine. Now, every comic is afraid of bombing. That's the biggest fear of any comedian. So he had a routine called the bombing routine, where he would tell jokes and see and watch the audience leave. And, and, and he, you know, who, who would do such a thing? It's one of my great negotiations with Andy. I said, Andy, I know it's unusual to do a bombing routine, but you don't have to do it for four minutes. The whole audience will be gone. How about doing it for like like 30 seconds or 45 seconds? He said, well, maybe I'll bring it down to three minutes. I said, I said what about a minute and 10 seconds? So we, we, I had to negotiate with him how length of time he has to bomb. and has to be the smallest possible length of time. But that was, that was him. And then he used to read The Great Gatsby by F. 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 Scott Fitzgerald. You know, he would... Uh, he would, uh, during a concert, he would start reading it, and the audience would get crazy. And, and Now, who would do such a thing? The audience would start crazy and boo. The only time it worked was on Saturday Night Live. You know, he did Saturday Night Live from the very first show. It was like his great, great home. And that and David Letterman's show were the places he just loved being. And then when he did Saturday Night Live, he came out in a tuxedo, and he said, and he was a big hit there, you know, every, t- every time he came on the show, because he played the conga drums. He was an incredible drummer, singer, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, Dhabi. And he's singing, dancing. He was very brilliantly uh, enhanced musically. So then he came out and started reading The Great Gatsby, and the audience started booing. He says, wait, wait, uh, you, if you want me to, what would you rather I do, The Great Gatsby or play the phonograph record? Everyone said, play the phonograph record. So he puts the record on, and it's him reciting The Great Gatsby, <laughs> and everyone laughs. So it ended in a punchline. But that was only a few, that was like four or five minutes, so it wasn't like doing it for 20 minutes or a half hour. But, but there was no one like him, and his wrestling was amazing with Jerry Lawler. Andy became the intergender wrestling champion of the world because he wrestled all the women. women. You know, when he did all these college dates, it worked very well. And then... But he shouldn't have done it on television. When he started doing it, you know, on the Merv Griffin show and then David Letterman show and uh, SNL, it, you know, it was the time of women's lips. So I said, yeah, it works great in the colleges. It worked at the comedy store. It works great. But on television with women's lib emerging, you know, it's not. So, so I, I, had, I had some negotiations with him, but he always ended up doing what was in his heart, his creative heart. So, but it was just the highlight of my life, one of the many highlights of my life because I worked with so many funny people. It was uh, amazing. And, and then with Jerry Seinfeld, he's, uh, he was, as I said, you know, I, I fell in love with him at first laugh when I first saw him at the Comedy Store. And he is so dedicated. He has a new book coming out that's going to be out October 6th. Like, it's like the greatest book on comedy and feelings. Every joke he ever wrote, he still has. He has it on yellow uh, legal paper, and every joke he had. In fact, when he did his first special for Netflix, uh, Jerry before Seinfeld, he had uh, replicas of every page, and it was on a street in New York, a big street in New York City. He's sitting around with the jokes filling up the entire street, and a lot of those jokes are going to be in his book and how he started. It's just, uh, just it's going to just be the best book ever written on comedy. 
and that's out October 6th. Also, he has a new special called 23 Hours to Kill that's going to be on Netflix on May 5th. You know, Jerry feels it's the best work he's ever done, and uh, it's very exciting. I was down there when uh, we we filmed it at uh, the Beacon Theater in New York City. My voice, I should have had water. I have no water. Do you have any water? Paul, do you have some water? I I have. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) I was going to say I have iced coffee. <laughs> that's, that's almost good. That's almost as good as water. So is there anything else we wanted to cover or did we? Did I talk too much? I feel, no. feel I'm talking too much. We're not talking about you. <laughs> what about you? How did your career start in music? Do you sing? Do you, do you play mu- instruments? No, I don't play any instruments. I, I pretty much, I've been doing this, this interview show for 16 years now. But of course, you know, you're known for your love and, and dedication to music but you don't sing at all because i thought maybe you could do a little song now i would only sing if you sang with me ladies and gentlemen paul leslie okay i'll sing my i'll, I'll, I'll sing you don't know the dewa clinton song right because I, I i can sing that i know uh you know ten because of you tony bennett oh because i know of you there's a song in my heart because of you, my romance had its start. Because of you, the sun will shine. The moon and stars will say you're mine forever <laughs> and ever to be. I only love, live for your love and your kiss. Oh, my God. Stop, George. Stop. <laughs> no, no. Better off seeing... <laughs> okay, now it's your turn. Well, I just saw Tony Bennett on uh, February 14th. He was at Atlanta Symphony Hall. Oh my God! He must be a hundred and one. Or <laughs> no, he's 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 uh, let's see, he turned ninety. He's early nineties, right? Ninety three or something. I think he's ninety three or ninety four. Yeah, wow. And I just went to Carl Reiner. I just went to, to dinner with Carl Reiner on his ninety eighth birthday. Incredible. And he's writing. He's writing books, and he's so active. And Norman Lear, he's going to be ninety eight in July, and he. He's doing uh, the fourth season of One Day at a Time. You know, he's doing uh, live in front of a studio audience with all, all in the family. Oh, and, and uh, oh, amazing. He did the Jeffersons. I don't know if you saw that. You know, they recreated the exact scripts from All in the Family and the Jeffersons. And, and look at these guys. Look at the vitality. We also did another documentary called If You're Not in the Obit, Eat Breakfast. I did it with Danny Gold, directed it. Amy Hyatt produced it with me. They also produced, uh, and uh, Danny directed The Bronx USA. But we had this thing with uh, everyone that was in it was between 90 and 100. Kirk Douglas was 100, and uh, I think 101 at the time. He he just left us at 103. But they had, you know, Carl Ryan and Mel Brooks, Dick Van Dyke, who's 93 now. He's still doing, he's still touring. He did a great job on Mary Top Poppins. And also, it's about laughter. These people all love laughter. They love comedy. Don't miss that one. It's still, the, uh, HBO just renewed it for three years. If you're not in the old bit, Eat Breakfast, which was based on Carl Reiner's joke. It was a different title, because when I was thinking about doing it, it was called Vitality After 90. I had it in my files for a couple of years, and Amy Hyatt, who I worked with, hit me on the head. He said, let's do this now. <laughs> so she motivated me, you know, in, into doing it. And then Sheila Nevins, who was with HBO at the time, she thought of changing the title to Carl's Joke. If you're not in the obit, eat breakfast. And that's what Carl did, and he's still doing it. He says he goes down, opens up the newspaper every morning, puts it on his kitchen table, and he goes to the obit, and if he's not in it, he goes and has breakfast. <laughs> So, they, I mean, this kind of vitality is absolutely amazing. And Tony Bennett was fabulous in it. He was just great. He sang The Best Is Yet to Come. Oh, that's a great song. And as you, if you saw him sing, you could believe that it's true, because you saw him like two, two, two years after, two or three years after he, he did the special. And he had just turned 90, so he must be 93 now. So that had to be a beautiful night for you. Oh, my goodness. He did not take one break. He started the show. He sang straight through. No break. What a guy. <laughs> yeah. He's a hero. <laughs> yeah, my hero, too. 
and Jerry's here also. We once did a a benefit. Jerry did a benefit at the the Rainbow Room, you know, at the top of NBC in New York. And Tony Bennett, you know, Jerry went on first, and then we were just in the like in the corner of the stage watching Tony sing and dance and do turns, and that was one, one such a great memory for me that night. It combined comedy and music to perfection. So I wish you were there with us, because mm-hmm. you would have appreciated. But that Tony Bennett, he was uh, yeah because of you, that that was. Uh, with one of my girlfriends uh, very early in life, that was one of our love songs, you know. That was our song. Because of you, there's a song in my heart. I don't want to torture the people by singing it again. We'll, we'll get into some more singing later. <laughs> okay. Remind me to sing the Dean McClinton song. Okay. Because it's, it's part of the documentary, The Bronx. Because we went, when we went back, there was 68 years later from our graduation. And the kids, so for the fun of it, I started singing to see if they, if the song was still valid. And, and, and it was the Danielle, who was the class president, you know, she joined right in and, and another young man uh, joined right in and we sang. D with the L-I-N-T-O-N, boom, Clinton, oh, Clinton, ever to be fairest of high schools. Give her three times three, oh, fellow, oh, may we cherish thee, faithful will be. Clinton, oh Clinton, for you and me. So they joined right in. How do you like that? It stayed the same except for one thing. When I went to D with Clinton, it was uh, all boys. Then it became co-ed. And instead of oh fellows, that phrase, they changed it to oh students. <laughs> Otherwise, the song was exactly the same. You know, I have a history on this show of coercing or tricking my guests into singing. Well, you didn't trick me. I, I, I was out. Oh my God, I'm embarrassed. No, no, no. I would have rather been tricked. I would have rather been tricked into singing than my, than came from my thought. You make it I easy. I guess I'm a frustrated singer. <laughs> no, you do you just... like Frank Sinatra? Oh my goodness, I did on the radio show. I wasn't driving people crazy, but maybe some. The year of his centenary, the the 2015, I played nothing but Frank Sinatra for a month and a half. Oh my God! I would have loved it. <laughs> I would have loved listening to it. He was, he was, he helped with a lot of romantic nights in my lifetime. This beautiful singing, <laughs> and also where I worked with his son, I why, sweetest boy, you know Frank Sinatra Jr. Oh yeah, because uh, you know I worked with him and got him some jobs on variety shows. Because when I first started at, at William Morris, I came to California. I was in New York, and but they, all the production team moved to California. The variety shows and four star and all, all the, the film westerns. So when the production started really getting heavy in LA, I started a rumor that George Shapiro was being transferred to, to uh, Los Angeles. And the, the rumor took, so I got transferred and I, I, I came out here and I started working out here and it was, uh, and all those variety of shows. And so I booked Frank Sinatra Jr. on some of those shows and I just fa- found him to be a, a wonderful, engaging young man. Did you ever meet him? I have to say, you really made me smile because of the the hundreds and hundreds of people that I've interviewed, the interview that intellectually I returned to again and again was my interview with Frank Sinatra Jr. Oh, isn't that great? Wasn't he charming and very genuine? Oh, yeah. And smart. Goodness. Very smart. And I think talking about people with the greatest challenges... How would you like to be brought up in Frank Sinatra's shadow? The greatest singer ever. You know, and because uh, uh, I would say, because the, Be- 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 the Beatles are a group. So in my opinion, the, the Beatles were the best, the group. <laughs> but Frank Sinatra, there's no, no better singer than him. Absolutely. Pavarotti was good too, but there's no one like Frank Sinatra. Amen. <laughs> but I'm so glad you, did you spend time with him? Much time with Frank Jr.? No, not so much. It was mostly for, for the interview? Mostly for the interview, and also I interviewed a lot of the musicians around him. The day that he passed away, I was at the same hotel as him interviewing his conductor, Terry Woodson, that right. day in Daytona Beach. It's wild that you would mention him. It's really... it. it but it, you want to know what's wild? What's that? He was... I, I, yeah, I'm a... I'm a 
you know, as strange as it may seem, you know, I'm a Brooklyn Dodger fan. Uh, even though Howard and I, out of the 15 boys, everyone, of course, is, is how great is it to be brought up in the Bronx with the Bronx Bombers, with the Yankees dominating. We, we, Howard and I had this philosophy of being with the underdogs, and the Dodgers were the underdogs. They were a very colorful team. The Yankees were so dominant you know, arrogant, dominant, and uh, they were incredible. So we we became Dodger fans, and uh, it, it was so great that, that, that they finally won. The greatest day of my life was 1955 when the Dodgers beat the Yankees for the first time in a World Series. So then uh, I'm back at Dodger Stadium, still, you know, getting tickets to the Dodger games that I live in L.A., which is interesting because I came out I, with the I – the Dodgers came out here in uh, – 58, and I came out in 1961, so they had the same team intact. So when I moved from uh, New York to L.A., it was the same Dodgers. It was so great. And then recently, but right before he died, Frank Jr., he sang the Star Spangled Banner at Dodgers Stadium, and he was sitting near me, and we were able, and I talked to him and reminisced, and it was an, an incredible emotional experience. It was so great seeing him again. And it's him singing the Star Spangled Banner at Dodger Stadium. What a what what a great twist of in life that 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 was so exhilarating. And I'm so glad that you know him. That that's great. He was a uh, he was an uh, amazing young man. Hmm. It's a shame he left us so early. He was in the '60s, I think. Uh, yeah. I th- I th- well, he was. Uh... See, from my perspective, from my perspective, that's very young. Yeah. <laughs> but and, uh, and from your perspective, it's on the older side. Well, that's true, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I've met people who are very young that were old, and I've met. Oh yeah, the oldest person I had on this show, believe it or not, he was 113 years old and 11 months. Wow, the record is 116 for a man. That's absolutely. Is it a male? Male, yes. Walter Bruning was his name. Wow. 113. Unbelievable. Yeah. 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 And he, and here he was, a guest on the show. <laughs> wow. Because the oldest I hung out with it was Kirk. Kirk was 103. And I was at his 100th birthday party, and he had a, had a martini with him. Because uh, he, was, he was amazing. He was still working and active. But 113... And uh, on, uh, if you're not in the obitty breakfast, we had Ida Keeling, who's still around. She's 104 now, and uh, she 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 ran. She was a runner, and she did. In fact, two years ago, she was in the Penn Relays. There, she was all over the the news, and, and uh, she said she doesn't run as often as she does now. But but she's 104, so she doesn't have to run that much, you know. But but she's still up and about and and still exercising at 104. It was amazing. Then we had Tao Bushan Lynch, who was a uh, yoga teacher. She was 98 at the time, and she was giving lessons in yoga. Half the class were instructors, and she had the greatest poses. You've got to see that. If you're not in the Obiti Breakfast, it's not, you could get it on uh, HBO. I'm going to watch it tonight, definitely. That's great. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You're going to love it. I bet. You probably, you probably interviewed a few people on the show. <laughs> you know, you mentioned a lot, of, a lot of people here, and a lot of them are known for being funny, but not just comedians. Who is the funniest person you, George Shapiro, have ever met? <laughs> That's an, an incredible, incredible question. You know, you, you're saying you, a lot of people, you know, you know, you automatically go, you know, Jerry Seinfeld aside, who I fell in love with his comedy, you know, like uh, I, I would put it in that category, uh, Mel Brooks, uh, who, who that's called, no one's funnier in the world than Mel Brooks, according to Carl Reiner. I can't re- refute that. I mean, to me, I remember laughing nonstop with Richie Pryor. I saw him, uh, you know, live from the Sunset Strip. And this was a concert for, you know, an hour and 40 minutes, close to two hours. I just didn't stop laughing. He's a, but, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, do you have any friends or people? There's, well, I'm going to say a name. His name is Robbie Nanus, And nobody knows him because he didn't go into show business. But uh, throughout 
my childhood into adult, young adulthood, he was the funniest person I've ever seen. And I think he didn't go into comedy, but do you have anyone like that? Like a friend that is so funny, never even thought about going into the show, into show business. Oh yeah. And uh, so that, that just had to mention that because he made us laugh throughout our childhood. He was so funny. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's uh, you know, you know, also a nonstop funny, you know, Rodney Dangerfield, because I don't know anyone that gets jokes out that fast. Oh yeah, know? just one after the other. I was so ugly when I when I was born. The doctor slapped my mother. <laughs> my mother said, "No breastfeeding. I think we should just be friends." You know, yeah, he has a whole slew of them. Yeah. <laughs> He said, you, you know, you're growing old when your testicles tell you it's time to shave the lawn. <laughs> I mean, he just, I mean, but, but he, it's, it's all one liners and he just uh, was absolutely amazing. Hmm. He said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we met each other. <laughs> but it's just all one line that, that, that he gets uh, that, those laughs out of. So, so he has to go in the category of one of the funniest people around. Yeah. Well, you know, when I asked you that question, the first name that came out of out of your mouth was Jerry Seinfeld. Well, you know, because he's he's my he's my client, and I fell in love with his at first laugh, and you know, and and I, I, and he kept me laughing for the whole nine years we we did Seinfeld together, and that whole cast uh, was absolutely amazing, and he and, and Larry David just wrote every rewrote every script, and they 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 had their stamp on it, and. Uh, and, and the, the cast with uh, Michael Richards, with uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, oh, the whole the whole thing, and uh, it was uh, Jason Alexander. I mean, they were all so individualistically funny, and then you combine them with great storylines, and that's uh, it, it, it's uh, they, so that that that's like nine years of, of laughter at all the readings and run-throughs and tapings. Uh, it was ama- as amazing in the show. You heard the story about the show uh, getting testing very, very poorly by NBC with the research, and they said pilot performance weak. Nobody cares about guys going to a laundromat. Yep. The the, the, the audience was uh, upset that Jerry Seinfeld's stand-up routine was interrupted by the storyline. All of this, it said in bold print at the top, it said pilot performance weak. And then I got a call from Brandon Tartikoff, who was a president of NBC, he said, George, I, I, I'm sorry, you know, it's not on the schedule. The comedy department passed on it. Then Rick Ludwin, who was in charge of variety television for NBC, and he handled the Tonight Show and the and, uh, David Letterman show when it was on NBC, and he was aware of Jerry. And he, after the comedy department passed on the series, he ordered four 30-minute variety shows. So Seinfeld was picked up for four variety shows, not even a sitcom. And because Jerry did stand-up comedy, the power of comedy, my young friend, because he did stand-up at the beginning, middle, and end of the show, it was a half a hybrid. It was a part variety show. And they got four shows, and that started it. That's how it stayed on the air. And then he did. A, it ended up being 180 episodes with 75 and a half million people watching it. And it became the most successful show of and history of television, and that's uh, that's why Rick Ludwin recently passed away, and I I told that story, you know, on his his tribute, and uh, it was uh, crazy. And then the work that they did on that show is just uh, memorable. So that so that was nonstop laughter, you know, for like nine years. And the incredible thing about that show is just how much it's endured. I mean, oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing because. Uh, we were just talking to, you know, Sony distributes the show. You know, it's a, it's owned by Warner Bros. because it was sold to, to first to TBS. There were, you know, Ted Turner bought it first, Castle Rock, the production company, and then Warner Bros. brought that. So Warner Bros. owns the show, and uh, uh, it's being distributed by Sony. And Sony made, like, unprecedented deal for, for cable and streaming at Netflix. It goes on Netflix next year. And uh, and then it goes on. Uh, it will go be on, on TV Land and uh, and Comedy Central on cable. 
And then the syndication is incredible. They made a deal, I think, for five years in New York and L.A. So it's, uh, it endured, is right. It's, and it's because of the characters. Another interesting thing, which Carl Reiner sort of started with the, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show, they didn't use any news of the day in the stories or, or colloquialisms or slang of the day. And that's why you watch the Dick Van Dyke show, and it's like it's happening today. And the same thing with Seinfeld, <laughs> except for the big phones, of course, at the time, when the phones started getting into uh, effect. But, but the characters, it's all about the characters and the, the brilliant comedy writing, and that it endures. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're still having fun with it. <laughs> it's kind of comforting to me, in a way, to know Someone is watching and laughing at a Seinfeld episode right this second. <laughs> yeah, but the beauty is it that the high school kids and college kids are discovering it. Yeah. They never heard of NBC or CBS or ABC. You know, <laughs> it's all it's all streaming and uh, the internet and YouTube, and they get it. And it, it, that's that's what's so incredible and so satisfying that all the young kids are just loving the show. And so it's going to go on and on and on and on and on. George, what is the best way to live life? Wow. Well, I think the best way to live, live life is to enhance lives of others. There's nothing more satisfying. You know, part of it, is, I think part of it is with, with my calling is bringing laughter to life. But anytime you have an opportunity to help someone, and enhance their life in so many different ways. It could be monetarily. It could be with uh, just uh, with support uh, morally and and creatively. It's uh, I mean that that's uh, and that as I said earlier, I think that stems from my mother and my father because they were always uh, helping people, being uh, very humanistic. So I think that's the best the best way to live. And I have that philosophy of the people in my office, you know, Tammy and Amy and Shelly and, uh, you know, my nanny. I have a nanny. You know, you should, everyone should have a nanny if they're, uh, if they're under four or over 70. They should have a nanny. So I have a, a nanny, Donna. And uh, so she's part of my life also. And uh, they, uh, they all enhance my life and I like to enhance other people's lives. Don't you think that's a good idea? And the laughter is a very, very big part of it, that, I, that I, I, my calling has been bringing laughter to people. And you have succeeded. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I just found these people that are so funny, and, and, and just having an opportunity to help them show it off is, is great. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, working with Carl Reiner and Jerry Seinfeld and Andy Kaufman and... It's, uh, you know, it's uh, just a celebration of life for me. Well, my last question is very open-ended. Yes. I always like to give the guests the stage. What would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Oh, boy. I would say live life to the fullest. The most important thing, I think, is uh, to follow your heart. And uh, Dick Van Dyke's book, incidentally, is keep moving and do what you love. You know, and I, I've done what I've loved my whole life. And, uh, it, it's, uh, there's no better advice than that, that you just follow your heart and do what you love. And, um, uh, and the adjunct is to enhance other lives. Boy, you could have a lot of fun in life. I'm still having the best time. I agree with Tony Bennett. The best is yet to come young man. The best <laughs> is yet to come. And I want to thank you very much. Very, very much. Thank you, Elvis. You're very welcome, George. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Elvis Presley, by the way, he loved Andy Kaufman's impression. Because course, we met, met a couple of the people from his band, and he said he just, Elvis just raved about Andy. <laughs> he said, I like the way he says, uh, he liked the way he moved his lip. You know, he moved his lip like, like, perfectly. You know, so <laughs> I'll end with that. And thank you for, for a great interview. It was a lot of fun talking to you. You are the best. You are the best, young Paul Leslie. Well, thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate this. Okay, you take care. <laughs> bye bye. All right, till next time. Bapa doodly beep bapa dee da. A deep bumpity boo, a rapati canaz a jeep 
Goodbye.